Hey guys, it's your boy here, and this is how to play offlane Earthshaker in 706 with OG's Gustav as for Magnuson. First of all, Earthshaker is not a hero like Centaur, X, Underlord, Legion. You don't want to get PMS and trade with the supports. The strengths of Earthshaker are his high move speed that allows you to get in and out of experience range and Fissure that allows you to get experience. But that kind of changed in 706, so uh, just wait a little bit. As you can see, as far as clarity, you have mana to use Fissure and Boots to feel safe in the lane. If you know you're against a solo lane of, let's say, Spectre or Slark, a weak hero, maybe getting PMS and maxing Ancient Totem is okay, but against most dual lanes and tri lanes, this is usually the, the better build. One very interesting thing to note though is that after the offlane change you already get a pretty good creep equilibrium spot, meaning that you're not forced to block the lane with Fissure at level 1. Also, since you have boots, you almost always have time to fix blocking errors since you're so fast, especially when you're in the dire side. Another point to note is how much S4 focuses on getting the range creep. I've been talking about this for months, but it's always nice to see that he saves Fissure for this creep while also trying to get both Wraith King and Enigma in it. While he had the chance to get other creeps with the skill, but saves it for this one. This shows why Magnuson is considered one of the best offlaners out there. The lane is awesome for him, crispy lane positioning and experience until he gets nuked. The damage was done though. Radiant didn't try to reset the creeps until this point and that gets S4 level 3 in 2 minutes. Enigma did his best to help Brave King in the first levels, but there is no way Enigma will be babysitting, which gives us far the chance to contest this pool. Since Brave King Murana is not a strong lane, he doesn't even need to fissure lanes. Yes, Earthshaker loves Blink, but people really underestimate what levels alone can give this guy. As I say that lane is weak though, as far plays too greedy again. One thing some people don't understand about the difference between support Earthshaker and core Earthshaker is that the support almost always maxes fissure because that's the only damage he will be able to provide for a long time, since it takes a while until he gets levels and gold for the blink dagger. Offlane Earthshaker has more levels and will have blink dagger making more use of the passive, especially when you're against a melee core like Rave King. With Vision of Enigma and Murana mid, he can play very aggressive and does maximize aftershock. He held the point for a while and we can finally see how strong it is against that one versus one against melee heroes. He can be super annoying against Rave King, getting denies and there is really nothing Rave King can do. He either dodges the aftershock but gets denied anyway or tries his luck. See how S4 uses Rave King going for less hits or denies nice to set up the stuns. This could be a kill, but against so many creeps he decides against it. I also like how he tries to use the animations to make Wraith King feel self-conscious about going for last hits or doing whatever he's doing. If Wraith King gives up, then he doesn't spend the mana and manually gets the last hits. I wouldn't expect anything but this from such a beautiful man. Here we can see that Wraith King is actually forced to stun our boy S4 to get a last hit and that easily allows Magnuson to set up a beautiful arrow in his Swedish face. Even though he dies, see how hard it is for Wraith King to farm there? As the laning phase ends, Mrana tries to keep ganking and Enigma is farming. Yeah, he died 3 times but he's actually as farmed as the carry Luna, that's insane. Not only that, he's ahead of the Wraith King, which in the end completely balances the fact he died a couple of times. A lot of people also like to get Arcanes or even Iron Talon to farm that fast blink, but look how many intermediary items as far as going for. Casual Bracer, Tranquils, Raindrops, this allows him the HP and mana region to keep farming the lane. The Radiant lineup was not made to keep helping Wraith King in the lane, which means that he shouldn't confuse his deaths with the enemy lane being too strong. Also, him being in the lane as we can see from the last hit charges and levels, is not only great for him, it's terrible for Wraith King. People really underestimate how winning the lane and holding the tower is important when you're playing off lane. A lot of people struggle for the right time to rotate. Well, if you look at the minimap, Radiant performed a pull. In these scenarios, it's obvious that S4 will have to back since against TP reactions he can end up dying again. He has two options now, jungle or rotate. Considering his items, rotating is definitely the best option. At this stage of the game, most of the rune wards already fell down and if Radiant has a ward, it's probably in in the safe lane or in the mid lane. These wards are usually placed to protect the cores, but since S4 is rotating through a different angle, the common ward will probably not spot his movements. He makes sure to test whether Necro knows about him or not, and then you only need to land a good fissure. Great kill for the dire. Until this point, you're probably thinking, well, yeah, but Tranquils didn't do anything here. There was not a lot of harass against S4, and when you want to attack the creeps, you're going to lose the HP region. This build makes no sense. But in reality, it gives him the opportunity of kills like this, one that you will never pull off with 
naked boots and iron talon, he realizes that Enigma is there and this skill is so out of this world that even Enigma didn't understand he had a chance of dying. He's only level 5 since he had to help Wraith King so much and even with more move speed since the creep wave is coming and that's actually the crazy part about this skill as for knew the creep wave was reaching Enigma and the only way for him to survive was disengaging through the trees. But Enigma didn't even comprehend Magnus's intent and gets exploded. Even if he casted Malefice it would be a level 1 and wouldn't change the outcome of this fight. Despite of Rubik's lack of social skills he was so amazed at what happened that he could only applaud Earthshade. After that kill, he doesn't need to go back to base, he doesn't even have to use the shrine. And since we're talking about going back to base, I can see a lot of people trying to farm their way back to base. And while that is fine if you really feel like the enemy lane is too strong, that's not the case here. A Wraith King is a very slow hero with only one disable. They have a jungler that needs to farm his way back into the game, guaranteeing that S4 can stay there and keep annoying him. They almost pop reincarnation, but watch closely. Ricky gets initiated and look how S4 plays this. Most people would stun instantly to save Ricky. Wraith King doesn't have the biggest damage output, so he ways to see what's going to happen while he walks there. And with Slider there, he knows he can't kill Wraith King, but he also makes sure to stun both heroes instead of only one, since maybe the Slider stun could set up another Wraithfire Blast. In the end, they force the Kings out, but they lose Ricky. The fact that S4 didn't pop the shrine ends up working in his favor in this fight. I mean, Ricky dies again, but it was a huge rotation from the Radiant team. Every time a team plays like this, you can bet your ass that they reward some part of the map. See how S4 positioned himself there? He's still getting experience and in case his team wants to defend, he's there. But if he gets like too close to the tower, there's probably a warning that Cliff and he's going to die. Going anywhere won't yield too much. He Defending the tower as an offlaner is the key on securing farm for yourself, but also to refrain the carries farm since he will always be there trying to take it. What goes on now is just mind blowing. He shows up pretty much only to buy time. He's in a spot where Radiant can't really dive him that easily. That ultra tanky build also helps him pull off stuff like this. That could be a two man out, maybe he kills those two heroes, but there's no follow up. The tower is still there and he can buy more time. When Wraith King finally goes for the final blow, he perfectly blocks Wraith King and gets an amazing note. They kill Wraith King which was what they wanted and since there's no fissure he needs to back. This type of play gets severely punished if you have brown boots and iron talon and 1.5k gold for your blink. Not with these items though. Being able to survive through all of that guarantees him all this farm that finally secures a 13 minute blink dagger. An amazing time considering everything he purchased beforehand and that he died quite a lot in the laning phase as well. He wasn't going to TP mid and instead was going to walk with the TP ready to be able to help anyone but SF gets picked off though and as far does the same to make him him feel better about himself. He's such a bro. As far as playing serious now, he snipes Murana here, but pay attention to this clip, he wants his team to push mid since there's no black hole, but SF gets initiated. The thing here is, most people would fissure that hero instantly, and that's not how you should play Earthshaker, unless you know more people can't come or your ally will die if you don't do anything. You want to wait a little and see what's happening. As you can see, Radiant reacted to that. He could have easily got a two-man Echo Slam and maybe killed those heroes, but one, Ricky has ult. 2. It's night time and apparently no one has vision of him. And 3. If they wait the Ricky out, it's very common for players to clump up wanting to kill him before he blinks away, even though they were being very cautious. By also not fissuring beforehand, Raiden doesn't know whether Earthshaker is there or not, guaranteeing more AoE damage and control when he goes. I also really like that he stuns in the direction Murana ran away, but also in a way to stun Wraith King. Crispy play. When Wraith King stuns Ricky after that ward, look how S4 reacts. He doesn't fissure again, we see him waiting to see where everyone is to land the most damaging and effective fissure possible. And he gets 3 heroes this time. See how he doesn't go in like crazy as well? Considering this game, he expects more people to be around. And indeed, Mirana was close, and when S4 finally goes in, see how he focuses Enigma, he is the most dangerous target since Black Hole was ready. Now that both of his most important skills are not ready, he disengages again. Earthshaker is all about surviving as much as possible and providing as much control as possible. Spotting one target is fine with your Echo Slam, but you can do way more
more than that. And it also shows how the hero can shine even without his ult. He ends up finishing Murana and a big part of this kill is him running to the fog instead of chasing her through the lane, which would give Murana the opportunity to maybe dodge it, or for any other enemy to stop as far. What ends up hurting him though is that he stuns Wraith King here, but with Slider showing up, he vaporizes. I'm not sure how much I need to talk about this, but as S4 responds, Slider initiates on Shadowfiend and pay attention to how S4 reacts. Instead of stunning right away to let Shadowfiend run, first he waits whether more people are coming or not, but he also waits in case he can turn it on Slider. If he uses Fissure while SF is stunned, there's no follow-up damage, and the Fissure plus Ancient Totem is definitely not going to be enough for the kill. If he waits as far to be free though, and also waits to confirm that there's no one there, they can potentially turn the fight without the Echo Slam. It doesn't happen, but knowing how to get the skills without the ult is the main difference between an amazing Earth Shaker and a normal one. Right after that engagement, and since S4 saved the Echo Slam, look what he achieves. Ricky's ult again serves as a setup for Echo Slam, and I love how he ends up attacking Necro with the Ancient Totem, since he is the hero that can heal, and also the hero that gets Ethereal. Nice kill. Eventually another fight starts. Look how S4 plays it. He ends up blinking in a way to stun the heroes that are in front, but also to stun Necro with the Aftershock. So not only he provided control to his allies, he also got one free kill by just waiting when to fissure. As the fight keeps evolving, Enigma never had the chance to use Black Hole. So who S4 jumps first? The squishy Enigma or the Rave King? great jump. As the fight progresses, they end up focusing Wraith King, and look how S4 plays here. He uses the Force Staff to get the Blink Dagger cooldown, and also uses Ancient Totem in a way to avoid larger stun. And in the end, he actually explodes him. That Ancient Totem was still one, so he uses Fissure first to use that stun duration to hit the first attack, and then he manages to dish another one right after. It might feel minor, but choosing the skill warder correctly in fights can have huge implications, especially with low cooldown heroes like Earthshaker, that allows for these types of plays. In the end, he perishes. He was probably trying to use Echo Slam to set up a kill with Ancient Totem later, but had no mana, and Mirana is alive again. All of this is amazing on its own, right? What's great though is that S4 bought so much time that Luna took the top Rex by herself. The fact that S4 was able to live for so long, dragging everyone and stunning everyone for so much time, guaranteed so much control and disable that the Radiant team got completely blinded to what was going on in other areas of the map. And this is a 7k average match, so yeah, it's not easy to pull that off. Well, this wraps up for today. If you enjoyed this video, please guys, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see the extended version of this video, check the link in the description. Pugin is a platform where you can learn from people like Chessie, Fog, Munib, Waga, and get better at the game. They have now great content on the new patch, and if you want to raise your MMR, it's a great time. Just figure out the patch faster than others and get those easy wins. You're also making a giveaway. You can win a replay analysis from me, from Lizard, the 7k stream, and three Juggernaut Arcana, so go after that. If winning MMR is not enough for you, though, you should definitely check out our new partner, Loot Case. There you can win and find beautiful cosmetics and go from zero to hero. They also give you a bonus on every deposit you go for, so if you register with my referral link, you're gonna get an even bigger one. I'm also going to cast the Manila Masters tomorrow, so just tune in my stream and you're gonna have a good time.